Oh, those words. Lay down our crown at his precious wounded feet. I don't know, those, those speak to me every time we sing that song. And this morning I want to talk about his wounded feet and his wounded hands. But I want to give you a little background to what I want to say here. Last October, I was down in Texas. My dad was going to have knee replacement surgery. And so early in the morning of a surgery, we got up before dawn and we're driving a couple hours to Tyler. And on the way, I thought, well, I'll, I'll play music I think my dad would like. So I put on the Southern Gospel Sirius XM channel. And while we were listening, they played a tune that was a little out of sync with just pure Southern Gospel. They played a bluegrass song that I came to research and it had been written in 2014. And I think the words of this song really condense a lot of the aspects of Jesus' sacrifice. But as we were driving and, you know, the light was just beginning to arise, the words of the song started, you made the life from the darkness and the stars to outnumber the sands. You were born into the world a baby and still held the whole world in your hands. And by this point, the melody and the tune was simple enough. My dad was sort of humming along, harmonizing, and I thought, well, this is, a, this is a nice moment here, and I don't get to see him that often, and leading up to the surgery. And then the chorus began. You made a hill called Calvary, where you made a way for me. You made the man that drove nails in your hands. You even made the tree. By this time, he was singing along, and I thought, well, what did that say? Well, I had not known the song, I, in the chorus, I was just sort of listening. So by the time the second verse started, I thought, I'm going to listen more closely. And the second verse talks about him making the tree, God caring for the tree and preparing it to be the cross on which Jesus was crucified. So by the time we got to this chorus the second time, I was really listening, and he says, you made a hill called Calvary where you made a way for me. You made the man that drove nails in your hands. You even made the tree. You know, God and our Lord created humans. And he saves this creation and the humans that are turned away from him. And he serves his creation, and he saves us through a service. But not just through service, but through ultimate submission to his creation. We're having a class, or currently in this class, we're talking about the way God turns things upside down, the way he does things that we don't expect. The way he does things that even the most devout believers in the Bible did not expect. That it's difficult for us to fully get on God's wavelength. And this, the cross of Jesus Christ, has to be the ultimate irony of the scripture. The ultimate way that God has turned things upside down from the way we would expect God to save humanity. Instead, he saved humanity by having his son having spikes driven through his hands. And the words of this song reflect and condense many scriptures that expand these thoughts. And this morning, rather than doing some deep analytical dig into some of these scriptures, what I would like to do is read several of them and ask you as a reading on them to reflect and meditate and think about the God that we serve, his power, his saving grace, his submission to his creation. We're very familiar with Isaiah 53, but before you get to chapter 53, the really the part of the scripture that relates to this starts in chapter 52, where Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus says, See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. 
But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed a hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. He will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence. For they will see what they had not been told. And they will understand what they had not heard about. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and he looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weakness he carried. He was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God when it was really a punishment for our own sins. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. John begins his gospel really saying in a different way the same words of this song. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made that were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus, in his own words, expresses similar ideas. He says, the Father loves me because I sacrificed my life, so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for that is what my Father has commanded. Later in Luke, as Jesus has borne the weight of the cross to Calvary with the help of Simon, they get there and Luke records two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place of the skull, they nailed him to the cross. Now, in one respect, we all have nailed him to the cross, but I think Luke is referring specifically to these Roman soldiers who drove the spikes into his hands and feet. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And then Jesus said, again, I think most directly about these Roman soldiers who had just nailed him to the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers that had just done this gamble for his clothes. Father, forgive these men that just nail me to the cross. In Acts 2, this great sermon on Pentecost, Peter says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then after we get to chapter 4, standing before the Jewish leaders, Peter says, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man before you was healed by the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures, and it quotes from Psalms, where in Psalms it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then as John and Peter have returned to the church there in Jerusalem, they pray to the Lord and all the believers lifted their voice in prayer and said, O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this happened here in this very city. 
For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, then Gentiles and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. The well-known, beautiful passage from Philippians 2 that Paul penned, Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and was born as a human. And as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even a death on a cross. And maybe the passage that most directly links up with, I think, the thought behind this song. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began, but the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, what mind, even among people like Abraham and Moses and David, imagined that God would come in the flesh and allow his own creation to nail him to a cross for the purpose of saving his creation. That's the God we serve. The God who made us. The God who saves us. The God who saves us through submitting the Christ who saves us by allowing Roman soldiers to nail him to a cross and then pleading with his father to forgive the very people he had created who had nailed him to a cross. And we serve a God who has the ability to make all of these plans complete. As we said, and reflected back on that song, you made the man that drove nails in your hands. You even made the tree. Would the men come forward now and we'll partake of the Lord's Supper?